Okay, hello everybody and welcome to New 302. <clears throat> this is uh, nominally, I guess, the fifth, the fifth class, uh, October 8th, 2020. Uh, and what, as many people have pointed out, is perhaps the, uh, uh, the longest subjective year on, uh, in living memory. Um, right. Um, a quick note on that before we jump in. I'm going to be talking about uh, a couple of things today. This particular section is going to be on function theory. Um, but first, I wanted to, uh, to share something about the subjective theory of, of time a little bit, uh, just because I think it's always uh, interesting in the context of um, the passage of the class and so on and so forth. And I'm always sort of curious about people's feedback on the question. Um, okay, so this is, this is my subjective theory of time for what it's worth. And a few of you have, have already heard this in office hours, but you know, it's something I often do in the class. So here it is. For any given span of time that can be objectively divided into three even parts, the subjective experience of those three parts uh, is quite radically different and follows an acceleration track. So what I mean by this is if you take any given span of time and divide it into three, you know, objectively equal parts, okay, the first part will go subjectively slowly, the second part will go subjectively quickly, and the third part will effectively go so subjectively quickly that you basically won't experience it at all. So how does this work? Okay, well, let's say that you take... Uh, you know, a three month span, you know, the, a season, the summer, okay, your summer off, you got three months off. Well, the first month is luxuriant, right? It's like, ah, the right freedom to relax and, ah, you know, uh, extra time, what a luxury. Uh, that's the first third. And the second third is like, t -t 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 -t, it's going fast. By the time you reach the half way mark, you are like, things are accelerating. And then the third third basically goes so quickly, you more or less don't experience it and then it's over. Um, that is my general experience, and I find that that applies to spans of three months, and it applies to spans of three weeks, and it applies to spans of three days. Um, so we're coming into a long weekend. Um, again, it is, it's Thanksgiving for those who celebrate Thanksgiving, uh, and I recognize that a considerable number of people aren't going to be experiencing uh, Thanksgiving in quite the same way this year. Uh, I am among those people um, since I have, I've opted not to get together with my family just, you know, out of concerns of transmission and safety. Uh, I have a few family members who work in different schools and so on and so forth. And my parents are, uh, you know, as, as you would imagine from my own age, comparably older. And so uh, I've opted not to take the risk as I think many people have. So, it is a peculiar three days. Um, whether that three days is three days that you spend uh, sort of in the company of your family or whether or not it's three days that you spend separately, it is nevertheless a long weekend. And so I would invite you to, uh, to check in with yourself and test that particular subjective theory. Um, is it the case you find that the first day is luxuriant, that's a, that's a wonderful long Saturday, and then Sunday goes quickly and then Monday, and then you're back Tuesday. So you can test that out for yourself. Um, it also, of course, applies to the general span of the course. And I must say that I am always surprised as the months tick by. So the fact that it is, right, that we're now on our fifth class is already surprising to me. It sort of feels like it's just begun. And yet I recognize that, in fact, it's been going for a while and it's, it's going to seriously pick up. So yeah, there is a strange double thing. No, all of that, of course, is cross-wired against, um, you know, uh, the general anxiety of the world and everything that is going on in the world, uh, as well as the COVID season. So that sort of jangles the wires up. Anyway, curious to get people's thoughts on their own subjective time schema and whether or not they find that. Okay, so that aside, what are we actually talking about today? Uh, what we're actually talking about today is um, function theory. So we're talking about Jungian function theory. Now I had um, already previously uh, asked everybody to do the MBTI and I wanted to be clear, um, you know, when we were uh, talking about that, that the MBTI is not a, is not a, a particularly accurate representation in some ways of Jung's views. Okay. So although the MBTI was developed sort of based on 
Jungian typology, right, based on Jungian typology and function theory. Um, he, he was not a direct contributor to it, and there are some funny gaps. I, time permitting, I may address some of those differences, but the, you know, the core thing to remember here is that MBTI is not exactly um, uh, a perfect instantiation of Jung's typological theory. Um, and sorry, just uh, as an overview, for if you haven't looked at this, the typological theory, right, that, um, that humans possess a variety of functions that they have a variable strength in, right, variable facility with. Everybody has all of them, but we have variable strength and facility with them, uh, and that those are uh, um, sort of underlie one of the uh, primary sort of ideas that Jung has about the personality. So in some ways, it's the personality theory. It's certainly not the only thing that is a determinant of personality within depth psychology, but it's a major factor and it's one that people tend to use pretty readily. So the MBTI, not perfect, but if you've done your MBTI test, you probably have a, a rough sense of sort of these types and functions. And right. Um, Okay, so that's the first thing, and BTI imperfect. The second thing to bear in mind as we're talking about this is that the typological system itself um, has some problems in factor analysis. So when you apply stats to it, um, you know, there are issues both with MBTI and with Jung's theories. And I will discuss a few of those things, right? But nevertheless, um, the thing to remember here is while it has sort of less empirical validation and it has some problems with factor loading, okay, relative to more modern um, personality trait systems like the big five. Um, nevertheless, there are some things that it does and it's important to remember, okay, that essentially speaking, no theoretical tool, no scientific theory, right? No descriptive system is perfect. Um, that's not a thing in science. Um, they may overcome relative inaccuracies, right? Relative to their predecessors, but they're not perfect. That doesn't mean that they're useless. And this is a very important thing to remember when one is doing sort of theoretical work of any kind and scientific work in particular. So those of you that are familiar with Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, right? will know that there is this kind of recognized process, uh, which has become sort of so well known so frequently read and referenced that uh, the concept of paradigm shift has become, you know, a, like uh, a mainstay in just marketing jargon, right? Um, when I worked in marketing uh, many years ago, it was uh, still a thing in, in advertising and marketing to talk about paradigm shifts, right? We sort of throw that word around. But when Kuhn is talking about paradigm shifts, he is, you know, talking about when you have a sort of a scientific theory, and I'm generalizing here, but when you have a scientific theory that is descriptive, it almost invariably contains certain kinds of paradoxes and certain kinds of shortfalls. And eventually those paradoxes, shortfalls, inconsistencies, unanswered questions, right, in the theory pile up, right? So that gets lots of confirming evidence, but it also has these problems. And as the problems pile up, eventually a new theory comes along, which explains the data set uh, better, including resolving those problems and paradoxes, okay? So the classic case exemplar of this is that, you know, we, um, we have Isaac Newton's sort of physics, right? His theory of, of mechanics. And that does a, a quite good job of describing motion, right? But it contains some fundamental problems. And those fundamental problems are resolved to a great extent when Einstein uh, begins offering his theory of relativity. Right, And it turns out that relativity more accurately describes things and it resolves certain kinds of uh, paradoxes and problems, right? Issues in the theory, Newton's theory. And so there is a paradigm shift. And the key thing to remember what that is that the new paradigm, right? Um, subsumes the old paradigm. It is not simply a modification of the previous theory of explanation, it replaces it, right? It's a different theoretical standpoint. That said, relativity isn't perfect either. And even though Newton has been replaced, right? Newtonian mechanics have been, right? Sort of replaced in that sense. That doesn't make them useless, right? We still teach Newtonian mechanics in school, even though the underlying theoretical framework is largely deemed to be sort of incorrect at some level. Why? Because it still has utility, right? The fact that it is sort of not perfect in a bunch of cases doesn't mean 
that it doesn't have utility. It still has utility. So you can still predict the motions of planets quite well and the motions of objects and things and right projectile velocity and arc and all of this stuff that you can do with calculus. You can still do perfectly well under the system, provided that you're not involved in certain kinds of edge cases. So, uh, you know, it's important sometimes to apply charity into theoretical systems that have problems. And that's kind of the stance that I'm going to suggest in this case, right? Which is that, you know, there's an important sense in which we know that aspects of the Jungian typology, right? It's personality theory and the function theory. Um, don't, don't hold up well when you do factor analysis on them, right? There are some serious issues in there that we'll talk about. Nevertheless, that doesn't make it useless. Um, and as a descriptor, indeed, because it is so readily accessible to people, often that in and of itself can be useful, especially from uh, a kind of clinical perspective. So, you know, obviously, of course, you can get people who you have in your practice to, you know, do a big five, right? And doing a big five test is typically a fairly laborious thing. But let's say that they're sort of uninterested in doing this level of like analysis to figure out, you know, factors of personality. They're just not interested in that stuff. Although in my experience, most people are interested in personality tests, um, especially as applies to them. Most people are quite happy to take personality tests. Um, you know, but let's say that, that they're not for whatever reason, but they do, however, have MBTI, right? Or some, some other sense of Jungian function. Um, that's still useful. You can still use it to talk about things in a meaningful way, right? Of course, there are edge cases and disambiguations, right? Things where, you know, you have to sort of, you know, ballast it against other kinds of theories. But this is no less true with any other theory, right? The, the big five for all of its accuracies is not a perfect or all-encompassing description of personality either. It's just the best we've got, right? Um, so in a way, because the MBTI is so widespread, Okay, because it connects up with the material, because people generally find it to be um, kind of interesting, it attracts them in a way that I find often the big five doesn't, even despite the big five's accuracy, it doesn't seem to have quite the same pull for them. Um, there's still a certain amount of, of use to be had there. You can talk in these terms a bit, provided that you give, you know, some foreshortened version of precisely the caveat that I'm giving you now. So, um, that's just something to bear in mind, that the theoretical sort of imprecisions uh, of this thing don't preclude it being useful. And you can see that to some extent because aspects of it, of course, get carried forward, right? So, um, you know, the Jungian system is a three-axis system, right? And one of those axes is introversion-extroversion. And that axis has proven to be so well validated, empirically speaking, that it, in fact, just got imported more or less wholesale uh, into the big five, right? So the concept of extroversion, I mean, it's if in the big five acronym ocean, or if you prefer canoe, uh, the E is extroversion, and that's just the introversion extroversion axis. So there are aspects of this, uh, as I mentioned, that that definitely carry forward, right? They, they do in fact provide useful terminology. So all of that framing in mind. You probably, I hope, already done your MBI, um, MBTI test. You've looked at some of your classmates' tests, right, and had some chance to kind of discuss this stuff. I always think that's fun. If you didn't catch my comment, I am uh, generally an INFP. And when I say generally, what I mean is this. There is a school of thought that typically says that the functions are fixed, that your testing should kind of always land the same, that your types don't change. I don't believe that. I don't think that that's, um, I don't think that that's consistent with people's actual experience taking things. Certainly there are stabilities, we're not all over the map, but uh, I don't think that that's consistent with people's experience of taking it, particularly taking it over time, right? Uh, bearing in mind their test retest problems, but taking it over time. And I don't think that it's especially consistent with things that we see in the actual union literature, okay? So, you know, when we're talking about these functions, bear in mind that my, my general stance is that in fact, your, your relationship with your functions and the strength of your functions can change. And indeed often that that is a feature of the work, that a big part of the work is, uh, occurs through doing that thing. And Jung says as much, when he talks about the inferior function, the inferior function is very often, right? That's your entryway into the unconscious. And so we'll discuss that, but first, Let's get into the functions generally. Okay, 
So as I mentioned, right, the function theory is a, is a three axis system, okay? Um, so, you know, you can think about X, Y, Z, right? So it's sort of a three dimensional system. Um, and importantly, you move around in that system. You don't have, um, you don't have a fixed expression. Everybody has all the functions, flat, guaranteed. You all have them. The question isn't whether or not you have them. The question is your degree of conscious connection with them and therefore your degree of facility with them, how skilled you are with them, how developed those functions are, okay? Now I mentioned before when I was talking about right hand and left hand, right? This idea that for right-handed persons, right? The right hand is their skilled hand. It's the go-to hand for a large number of things. Why? Because it has dexterity. It has this kind of fine manipulation ability. It's the hand you trust, okay? And one of the first things that you need to bear in mind when you're talking about individual differences within this three axis function system is that people are going to have functions that they trust, the ones that they have more conscious relationship with, right? Those are gonna to tend to be their, their go-to, their default. Um, and very often it is the case that they will tend to be their go-to and their default, even in cases when that is not in fact an appropriate response to whatever the challenge problem you know, or, or whatever in the world is. They'll tend to default into a certain kind of function and, um, and often it's, it's quite difficult to overcome that. In really strong cases, people may even in fact demonize their inferior functions, right? So they may think of one function as being unquestionably superior and important and the other function as being degenerate or useless or, right? Um, so sometimes there's this really strong distrust and there's always some level of distrust. That's why you don't rely on it. It may even just be as far as the kind of distrust, which goes, I'm not good at that, right? Not good at that. Okay, so bearing all this in mind in your individual expressions, let's take a look at the three axes. Okay, so axis one, hold on, I will share. Okay. So obviously this is a two axis, um, this is a two axis diagram. If you, if you want to think about the third axis, okay, which is um, introversion, extroversion, think about it as being literally the third dimension, right? It's sort of popping out of the screen towards you or receding into the screen, right? That's the third, the third dimension if you wanted to picture this thing as a sphere instead of a circle. Okay, so the very first um, points that we'll talk about are introversion and extroversion. Okay, so most people, okay, we'll come back to this in a sec. Most people have, I think, a relatively strong intuitive sense of introversion and extroversion, okay? Now, some of that is stereotyped. We think of extroverts as being gregarious, outgoing, loud sometimes, right? Gregarious, outgoing, socially connected, energetic is a thing that often gets, gets tagged there, right? How do we think of introverts? We think of them as being shy, quiet, right? Um, not, not especially sort of socially engaged a lot of the time. Those are stereotypes and I think they're frankly not quite fair, right? So properly speaking, the way that you want to look at this is it's about where your conscious orientation primarily is, the outer world or your inner world, okay? So extroverts are primarily oriented to the outer world, whereas introverts are primarily oriented towards their inner world. That is the, the big distinction. And one of the kind of litmus test things that you can look at to distinguish the two is where do you get your energy? So the kind of quick, quick and dirty litmus test that I'll sometimes ask people is like, how do you, how do you feel if you go to a party? That's one of the questions I will often ask. It's not perfect, but it's, it's a pretty good loose test. How do you feel when you go to a party? So if you go to a party afterwards, are you drained? Does, is that something that you basically like need to recover from? You know, you go to a party, you know, you might be like, oh, that was a good time, but now I need some downtime. I need some alone time. If so, odds are you're an introvert. If on the other hand, you go to a party and it amps you up, right? If you leave the party and you are charged up with energy and in fact, it recharges your batteries, odds are you're an extrovert. And like I said, that's a, it's a loose test, but it's a pretty good one. And it, tells us certain things, right? Why does it charge you up? Because your conscious orientation, if you're an extrovert, is externally focused. And getting stimulus and connection in the outside world is sort of natural to you. It recharges your batteries because that's your, that's your space. That's your natural space is to be oriented, right? To the, to externalities. On the other hand, if you're an introvert, you may 
enjoy those things. And, and likewise, right? It's, it's, no, it's not a given that extroverts hate alone time, okay? But by and large, it's the case that if you're an introvert, yeah, you might enjoy socializing, but the point is it's not, it's not dominant for you. It's not as skilled. And so it takes energy, okay? libido within the union system, but you can even think about it in terms of just like, I mean, self-regulation literature is a little sketchy right now, but if you want to think about it, it takes a certain amount of focus. It takes willpower, it takes concentration, it takes effort, it takes effort. So you have to invest energy in order to be externally focused, right? In order to be chit chat, in order to keep your attention focused, because right, if you are an introvert and you've ever had the experience of being at a party and folding in on yourself, this is not good, right? It becomes a highly unpleasant experience a lot of the time. So, um, so that's, that's a relatively quick, quick test that you can use. A slightly more sophisticated version of that, you can ask the question like, which is the flip side. The flip side is if you spend time by yourself, right? When you spend time by yourself, how does that land for you energetically, right? How do you respond to it? And you know, what you generally find is that extroverts report finding time, you know, spending time by themselves, right, is, is draining. It reduces their energy. And then they need to socialize, right? They need to get into the world. They need to do something in the world, right? Um, introverts, on the other hand, right, often find that time nourishing. Now, that, again, does not mean that uh, no extrovert ever wants to spend time by themselves, right? Or want alone time or me time or whatever, right? Uh, nor does it mean that introverts, you know, uh, are always invariably going to prefer to sort of spend time with their own thoughts. But as a general trend, it's a useful one. We can often sort of sense that distinction in ourselves. Now, you know, one of the, one of the things about this that I think is sort of quite striking in this respect, when you think about it, is this important distinction, right? That being alone does not necessarily lead one to loneliness, right? Being alone does not necessarily lead one to loneliness. Some people, when they are alone, become lonely. Other people, when they are alone, and some, you know, obviously the same person can experience both states, theoretically, right, and practically, um, you know, there are possibilities for being alone, but experiencing solitude, and solitude is often quite enriching. It's quiet, it's calm, it's pleasant, right? For people that, you know, uh, lean that way. So being alone is not the factor. Also, please note, you can totally be with other people and experience immense loneliness. Um, and in fact, I often point out to, to people that the loneliest states, in my opinion, are the ones where you are with other people but do not feel seen or understood. So people who are in relationships, where they feel like it's not connecting. Yeah, they're with another person in theory, like they're sharing a life or sharing a bed or whatever, right? But, but they don't feel connected, so they don't feel lonely. So it's not about the presence of people per se, right? Loneliness is a state of connection, not a state of, right? Not a state of sort of being around people. Um, but being around people certainly makes it somewhat easier to connect with them as we've all discovered over the course of this year. Um, the, <clears throat> the culture of talking televisions notwithstanding. So, um, yeah. So introversion and extroversion are interesting um, because typically we do move back and forth across the line. And as I said, my belief is that, um, that in fact our orientation can change considerably. So I used to test as considerably more introverted than I now do. Um, now I typically test with a slight preference for introversion. And I, I like to credit that, um, hopefully, to my own efforts, which is I went through a period where I concertedly attempted to learn how to extrovert. Now, it's still not my natural mode. I can do it. I can flip it on. Um, to be perfectly honest, having a few drinks never hurts, uh, and lots of introverts find that, and that has its own problems, right? But I can do it without that, too. If need be, I can extrovert. I can sort of project myself into the world and connect with people in that way. And I can do it reasonably on, on command, uh, which is pretty handy in my line of work, right? As I can't help but afford to just be folded into my own mind as it were. Um, so I can learn to do it. 
Um, and likewise, of course, people who are not naturally inclined to spending a lot of inward time can of course learn to do it, right? They can become more contemplative. They can look inwards, et cetera, et cetera. So over time, it's certainly the case that you can develop facility, right? In, in moving in both directions and fluidly moving through the space, right? Doing things in a sort of phase function fit appropriate fashion, right? Timing your function so that it's at an appropriate moment so that you're deploying it appropriately. So yeah, if you're at a dinner party, you don't want to probably fold into yourself in an introverted fashion, right? It's considered sort of rude, right? Although it generally isn't meant to be rude, but it's sort of considered rude. Likewise, if you are, you know, uh, on a meditation retreat, um, probably you want to be paying more attention to your inner space than you are to your, your outer space. So you can definitely move around in there, but people have distinct um, differences. Um, one of the interesting things about this period of pandemic and certainly the period of the, the first lockdown, and we'll see if there's going to be a second lockdown, um, is that it, it seems to have had really differential effects. Now, it's important to note that, you know, although there are general population differences, typically, at least within North American populations, there are more extroverts than introverts. Um, so extro extroversion tends to be more common. And there's a certain amount of evidence that shows that, um, you know, although uh, the demographics on these tests are nevertheless imperfect, um, that uh, extroversion is just generally more common. Um, and although we don't have space to do a lot of neuroscience, there's some really interesting results um, around sort of what introversion looks like on a neurological level. And uh, it seems that in a large part, what happens with introversion is that the information uh, sort of passes through a longer, more complicated route in the brain. So it's, you know, for introverts, as information is coming in, it's passing through different sort of regions on its way. That means that it's slower to process external information, but it's going through sort of more, right, more processes and adjustment and consideration internally. And so given that there is that much more processing happen internally, people's experience tends to be more internally located that in, in short, in very brief, um, seems to be the neurology behind things. But introverts are a minority. Um, and it, it seems like in pretty much every population, they're in fact a minority, despite there being sort of cultural bends. Um, now, a lot of the time, to be honest, that puts introverts at a social disadvantage, right? Introverts are considered to be, you know, weird or rude or um, charitably shy, right? and uncharitably snobbish or stuck up, right? They don't wanna talk. It seems like they don't like people, they don't like gatherings, right? And there, there sometimes is a, a quality of distrust that goes with introversion. We have a lot of introverts in this class, which I add, a bunch of you commented on it is not, in fact, especially uncommon for this course. Um, of course, because it is so focused on the quality of the inner life, um, Jungian depth psychology is naturally attractive in, in many ways to sort of introverts um, to bend that way because it's like, you know, it's, it's a promise to give a certain kind of structure and key and understanding to inner experience. And that is the primary focus and concern for introverts. So it's not uncommon to get quite a few uh, introverts in the class. We do actually seem like we have a particularly weighted population this time around. So that's interesting. Um, so introverts typically are at a, socially, are at a social disadvantage. Um, and one of the things, I mean, it's unfortunate because the, you know, the tweets and stuff that I saw had introverts crowing about this, which I think is not very fair. But, you know, you had introverts when the lockdown hit going like, I've been preparing for this for my whole life. And admittedly, I felt a little that way, right? Which was just like, there were aspects of suddenly having the external world stop, right? That were actually a tremendous relief. And you know, that with the caveat that I do a fair bit of, um, of extroversion, right? I'm, I'm very social. I'm involved in lots of projects. Um, I spend time with lots of people. I have an extremely wide net of friends and acquaintances and, uh, and so on and so forth. And I teach and I do therapy and like, I, I'm with people a lot, okay? But nevertheless, there was a sort of relief that came with the lockdown. And this is a kind of guilty pleasure, I think that a bunch of introverts don't wanna talk about because they are aware of the suffering that extroverts experience. Because for the extroverts, if you are used to doing all the things that you do in a social external world fashion, 
It's like the world was obliterated overnight. So my mother falls into this category. Um, she spent the first three months of the pandemic staying with my sister's family. And then finally, when things started to cool down a little bit, she opted to return to her own home. But her entire field of social events, you know, uh, uh, Tai Chi, book club, choir, the various sorts of things that she does were suddenly closed to her. And right, groups weren't gathering. And this lends itself to a tremendous isolation. And being an extrovert, that isolation is, is hard for her, right? Considerably harder for her than it is um, perhaps for, for an introvert, right? Um, yeah, uh, I've lived alone by times. I mean, in my 20s, I lived alone for like two years, two and a half, two and a half years. And I was writing full time. And there would often be long stretches where I just didn't see other people, sometimes days and days and days, didn't see other people. I maintained a certain amount of email correspondence, but it didn't, didn't bother me that much. Um, right? I was just working. I was concentrating my work. So I'd spend time reading and baking. Um, that was a period where I was doing a lot of baking. Um, but I would spend a lot of time sort of folded into my introversion and it wasn't unpleasant. If anything, I found the idea of sort of external intrusions um, a bit threatening, right? Uh, at the time. No, I'm glad to have largely rectified that. Um, but you can see that, that in a sense, right, when you get to these kinds of conditions, uh, there is a certain kind of advantage to introversion in the context. Um, that's why at the start of the pandemic, I referred uh, to sort of the social state that we were in as the involuntary monastery. So I, I was saying our whole culture has been shipped off to the involuntary monastery, meaning that we were all, you know, getting an opportunity to spend a whole lot of time with ourselves. Now, unfortunately, with ourselves and our anxieties, right? Um, because even if you're introverted, that doesn't mean that you don't care about what's going on in the world. Uh, it's just, you know, less, less of a focus, less of a draw. Um, so the involuntary monastery. Now, if you can't go outside, you can always go inside. And there's a value to being able to be introverted to do inner work, right? Inner work requires a certain amount of, of uh, introversion. You have to look inwards. But... And it's important that we sort of, you know, nail this down. It's something I've mentioned before, but you have to remember that when we're talking in Jungian depth psychological terms, most of the things we're talking about, um, when we're talking about, say, dream symbols, okay, we're talking about m many different kinds of complexes and sort of psychic events, right, are transjective, meaning they simultaneously point outwards and inwards, okay? So, when we get to the lecture stuff around dreams in a couple of weeks, um, and that'll be a fairly extensive sort of bank of material, one of the things that I will talk about when we talk about dream interpretation is the way that dream symbols point outwards, outwards, <laughs> and inwards at the same time, right? And they hold those things in tension, okay? Um, so it's not the case that you can't do work in the other world, is my point, okay? Um, and it's, you know, it's not that introverts are intrinsically more spiritual or any such thing, right? Uh, and indeed, right, discovering the kind of, um, you know, psychological and spiritual valence in the world is a big part of the work, right? So for the alchemists, and I, I, meant, to, I meant to flash my philosopher's stone during the self last week, and I totally didn't, but for the alchemists, right, this binding of mind and matter, right, the external world and the internal world, is the whole game. And psychoidentities, right? Uh, archetypes and the like. Likewise, right? They, they have this bridging quality, right? Between the outer world and the inner world. So neither one is intrinsically superior, okay? When it comes to doing the work, right? The great work, individuation work, self-work, okay? And you can do stuff in the outside world and it applies back in and you can do inner work and it applies out. So that's important to remember. Nevertheless, introversion and extroversion. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about the distinctions between introverted and extroverted versions, okay, of the, the other functions, okay, so we'll get to that uh, shortly, but let's run through the other four functions, so now I want that chart, there we go, okay. So you can see here that, um, you know, that beyond introversion, extroversion, we've got sort of uh, four functions, right, along two axes. So the first one we'll talk about is thinking, feeling. Okay, thinking and feeling, um, or, you know, what is, uh, 
um, what is generally sort of referred to as the the judging access uh, access rather um, in uh, in MBTI. So if you had a J at the end of your code, that's that's judging, right? And thinking and feeling are in that sense the judging functions. Why? They're the functions that make assessments about things. The other two functions, intuition and sensing, uh, sen sensation, right, are uh, perceiving functions. They're functions about bringing in information, okay? So intuition and sensation are about bringing information in, and thinking and feeling are about judging information. They're about making assessments. Okay, what are the differences between um, thinking and feeling? Well, lots of this is gonna be very straightforward to you, okay? Um, Thinking types tend to prize rational process, okay, logic, right, uh, to, to a certain kind of extent. Uh, rationality and logic and thinking things through often in a conceptual fashion, right? So um, it tends to be relatively speaking uh, sort of structured and it tends to follow rules, uh, if, you, if you will, okay? And you know, the idea is that you're, you are trying to define things and categorize them to a certain extent, right? And then, right, once you have some kind of systemic thing, use rational rules, logical rules, right? Philosophical rules to attempt to um, make your judgments about things, right? Feeling types, on the other hand, okay, are primarily drawn by, um, a sense of value. That is the, that's the key thing with feeling. Now, this is one of the issues actually in the factor loading of the, of the tests, as I mentioned, which is that feeling as an English word is a strange multivariate loaded word because feeling means three different things to us, at least three different things, okay? And three different things that are definitely confusing in this context, right? Feeling simultaneously means sensation, right? You have feeling in your hand, right? It means emotion, right? Uh, oh, you hurt my feelings. And it also means intuition in colloquial English, right? I've got a bad feeling about this. Feeling, therefore, is this, and, and those meanings tend to trade between, right? When we say, well, we just got to feel our way through it. Well, that's using a metaphor of sensation to indicate intuition or something, right? Or to indicate something else. So it's a very conflated word, right? The definitions of feeling. But in this case, feeling, okay, is about, is about value judgment. Now, it's not emotion per se, okay? Thinking types obviously still have emotion. The difference is that if you want to think about this in sort of modern um, neuroscientific terms, right? Um, feeling is a very fast system that makes judgments of things that code emotionally speaking. We get a value sense on things and it codes in terms of emotions. It is in fact in most of the dominant theories about what emotion is sort of doing for us, what the function of emotion is. That's the operating theory. Emotion is a kind of heuristic system that allows us to make very fast determinations that don't rely on the relatively slower process of like rationally crunching stuff through. Now, you know, the, the kind of folk distinction, right, that we make between thinking and feeling is like, well, you know, if we want to be uncharitable, right, the feeling types will be like, well, I go with my heart and they go with their head and they're a robot, right? That's the sort of uncharitable version. The uncharitable version from the thinking dominant is I use my head uh, and they go, you know, they, they just get tugged around by their feelings. They're not thinking clearly, right? Um, not quite they're an idiot, but they're, you know, they're not thinking clearly is typically it. Now, the function languages between these two things, as I mentioned, are one of the most common, one of the most common uh, distinction um, sources of friction and conflict that you see between two people in relationship, often romantic relationship, but not invariably romantic relationship, which is to say that two people are attempting to have a conversation or an argument or a debate about something, right, something that requires judgment, and they're thinking about these things with respective functions, but they're not acknowledging that they're using two different functions to do so. So one person keeps saying, um, but hold on for a second and think about this. And the other person keeps saying, but you're not listening to my feelings, right? And 
unaware in a certain sense that in speaking in those terms without recognizing that they're speaking two different functional languages, they're speaking at cross purposes. Those things don't code into each other very well, but they're both useful for making decisions. They're both useful for making decisions. It's a question of the effective deployment of which one when. So famously, you know, it, there is, um, and I mentioned this already, I think. Yeah, I think I did. Um, but, you know, there's a sort of a, a, a general cultural idea, okay, that if you could scrape your feelings off, then you would be some kind of amazing rational decision maker, right? All you have to do is banish your feelings, get rid of your feelings, right? I talked about this when I talked about the Spock Buddhist. Um, and that suddenly you would be this amazing ultra rational decision maker, right? Lightning fast, like a computer or something. And it's not true. Um, it's simply not true. So what we see, in fact, with people who have fairly serious damage to the limbic systems, where they're sort of emotionally um, muted, their subjective emotions are quite muted, um, we see this really interesting sort of set of behaviors. So let's say that you give that person um, like a standard IQ test, okay? And you say, you know, whatever, can you answer this IQ test? If their limbic system, if their feeling function in these terms is... Um, damaged or muted, right? Uh, they can answer questions that, that require rational process like an IQ test perfectly well, right? But if, when they're about to write the test, you give them this choice, would you like to write the test in a red pen or a blue pen? They will grind to a halt. They will grind to a halt. They'll, they'll deadlock, often for quite a long time, 45 minutes, an hour. Uh, the reason being that they will attempt to solve this problem rationally. And they will do the thing that people often do, which is a terrible idea for decision making, right? They will try to create lists of pros and cons. Now, this is like a, a thinking technique that gets taught to kids in schools. Divide a sheet of paper in half and list pros and cons on one side. And this is a terrible way of decision making. It's a terrible method most of the time. Because, of course, it gives no weight to the two sides, for one thing. It doesn't really take into account things that like are deal breakers, right? So that kind of decision, pros and cons decision, you could have 19 things on one side and two on the other and still feel ambivalent about it. It's not a good decision-making method, right? But people who have damage to the limbic systems will nevertheless attempt to sort of solve red pen versus blue pen in precisely this fashion. Uh, and so they'll start coming up with rational reasons why red pen or blue pen. And that's a terrible way to make that decision. It's just not efficient. It's not effective. It's not fast. Whereas what happens if you are using feeling function, unless there is some overwhelming rational reason to choose one over the other, you just go, uh, blue, because why? I don't know. That's what I'm used to. Uh, red, oh yeah, that'll pop. Like, that's it, right? Um, typically. If you are the sort of person who experiences, or if you know anybody who experiences, like tremendous amounts of, um, you know, anxious grinding when they're trying to pick an ice cream flavor or make a choice at a restaurant, um, very often, these people are, are uh, for whatever reason, blocked from using their feeling function to make this decision. And so they're falling back on a thinking function. Well, uh, what if I pick this? And oh, I can pick that. And let's run some future projections. And what if I'm disappointed in my choice? And uh, right now, some of that, of course, is just about um, being a satisficer versus a maximizer, something that we'll talk about uh, at greater length later. But some of that is about, you know, sort of the misapplication in some sense of, of function. So thinking and feeling, okay? One way to think about this uh, or feel about it, but one way to think about it, one way to understand it that I think is useful is that, and this is very often where I think the language gap between the two functions bogs down. One way to think about it is that thinking is concerned with truth. But feeling is concerned with, uh, if thinking is concerned with the true, feeling is concerned with the good. The true versus the good, okay? Now, that doesn't stop feelings from suddenly trying to claim truth. But of course, we're all fairly, you know, um, aware of the idea that like your feeling about it does not necessarily make it so. That's just your feeling. It's just your feeling, man. Um, thinking on the other hand is concerned with truth. Okay, truth, truth questions. Distinguishing those two things, 
that your feeling is about a sense of value, good or bad, right? A little more complex than that, but good and bad is the basic axis, right? That feeling is concerned with. Whereas thinking is concerned with true and false, just internalizing that distinction right there clarifies, is this the kind of question that is a truth question or is it the kind of question that is a value question? And depending what the circumstance is, you may be you know, misapplying uh, the function in question. So that is something to sort of consider. Um, right. Okay. Now the next axis, the sort of perceiving axis. This is the axis through which we get our information, primarily speaking, and it's sensation versus intuition. Okay. Sensation is reasonably easy to track. Okay. It has to do with physical sensations. Now, generally speaking, the sensing function also has to do with detail orientation, okay? And that's kind of important as we're moving on in the course. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the, the theory, psychological theory of gestalt, um, and that's not gestalt therapy, but rather the concept of gestalt, okay, within psychology. One way to think about this is that sensation is featural, okay? And intuition is gestalt. Okay, sensation is featural and intuition is gestalt. Sensation is about the trees, intuition is about the forest. Sensation is about the brush strokes, intuition is about the big picture. Um, that's one way that you can think about it, but it's a little bit more than that. So sensation typically has to do with, um, you know, this fine grained detail orientation and sensation specifically. And that sensation can be internally or externally directed. One can be uh, an introverted sensate, right? Paying very close attention to what's going on inside of them, right? Uh, and and uh, sort of their, their interoception. One can also be an extroverted sensate. One can be, you know, uh, focused on the outside world, right? Um, typically, we tend to think of those people as being sort of I don't know, hedonistic, if we're being uncharitable, or at the very least sort of worldly, sensual, right? Um, they often are finally in touch with their body because the body is this sort of interface point with sensation. So, you know, they may uh, have a certain, you know, a quality of, of foodiness or connoisseurship or athleticism or, you know, there's a sensuality, right? That goes with that, with being in tune with the body and in tune with the senses, both internal and external, that allow you to bring that kind of data to bear. But intuition is, intuition in contrast, right, is less about, is less about the data that's directly in front of you, less about the sensations, and more about the implication. It's about the possibility and the probability, right? It's about seeing these bigger picture patterns. And so if you're intuitive, you don't typically see objects, for instance, in my experience, as sort of what they are, but rather as what they could be. And this is an important distinction. Um, I have uh, a, a very strong, um, a very strong intuitive streak. I'm a, I'm a, a, a quite dominant um, intuitive. And that is something that I've worked on pretty hard in the last 10 years to try to bring into better balance with my sensation. But there are cases where it's really striking. I mean, for one thing, it makes me uh, uh, a bit pack ratty. Okay, and that, that's a complex of different things, uh, some of which we'll talk about later. But that's a complex of different things, that sort of pack ratty hoardiness, but a lot of it has to do with my ability to sense the possibility of things. So like, uh, you know, when I lived in England, I traveled around in England on foot as sort of a wandering mystical tramp. Uh, when I did that, I um, ended up with a whole pocket of my coat being filled with rubber bands because I would find these rubber bands all over. And every time I would find them, I don't know, outside grocery stores and stuff, I would end up picking a bunch up and sticking them in my pocket because that could be useful. And it's like, what would it be useful for? Was I gonna make a slingshot or a tourniquet, the bungee cord? What was I gonna make? I don't know. Um, I did end up using it occasionally to bind things in my backpack or whatever. But the point was that I primarily saw them not as like, you know, blue chunk of rubber on the ground, whatever, but in terms of their potentials, okay? And as an introvert, okay, and also as, um, uh, as an intuitive, I tend to experience the possibilities around things as a more primary reality in a way than the sensation stuff. Now, some of that is a function of being stable, okay, and um, this is sort of an important distinction. It's not 
it's not a Jungian depth distinction, but it's one we're going to talk about more often. So I'll run through it real quick. Stable labile distinction. People who are labile, generally extroverts, okay, when they experience a problem, um, they act in the world to solve it. Okay, labile. So when they experience a problem, they act in the world to solve it. They change something in the world. Stable persons who are generally speaking introverted, when they experience a problem, they act on themselves to change themselves to make the problem less problematic. Now, neither one of these stances is, as you'll often hear me say, intrinsically better. They're better in contexts. So, you know, if you are stable, you suffer problems like uh, often your home becomes quite messy. Uh, cute bookshelves. Your home becomes quite messy. Why? Because it gets messy and where a labile person would see that mess and immediately go, oh, I need to act on that in the world in order to reduce my distress, right? So they act in the world to reduce their distress and tidy. The stable person simply adjusts themselves. It, it, so they sort of, not typically consciously, but they turn it invisible, right? It becomes less salient to them. And that happens by degrees. They adjust themselves and just, right? And then one day they kind of wake up and they're like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> oh my God, you know. If you have two stable people living together, I lived with a, a guy, I had a roommate in my early 20s who was also really stable and our place was a disaster. It was, it was brutal because both of us, of course, just adjusted. We didn't have a lot invested. The building that we were in was kind of a wreck. It was a, uh, an old, it had been a movie theater out on Donlands, so kind of north of Greek town um, in the Danforth. And, uh, yeah, it had been a movie theater, the Donlands movie theater, but like it was a, it was a generally sketchy, sketchy building and maybe haunted. Anyway, that's a story for another day. But the point is the apartment got really rough because we were both stable, right? A labile person would never have let that happen. It would, have, it would have made them nuts, right? But we just adjusted. And we adjusted and adjusted and adjusted until things were disastrous. Now, that's a case where being stable is probably a disadvantage, right? But you can think of lots of cases where being labile is a disadvantage with things you can't affect. If you can't affect something, what do you do about it? And you see these cases sometimes when people are grieving, right? Because what do you do? They feel like they need to busy themselves, right? What can I do? I gotta clean, I gotta cook, I gotta something, da 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 da, -da energy in the world. Because they're trying to alter the world in such a way as to change how they feel, right? Rather than altering themselves. So you can see that there's a correlation, right? Between labile and extroversion, stable and introversion, right? Um, so uh, a funny story about this um, that I like to relate that gives you some sense of how this relates to the sensate um, intuitive axis, right? Um, in my case, anyway. So my mom is also fairly stable. She's an extrovert, but she's a stable extrovert, relatively speaking. And uh, so when I was in high school at one point, our fridge in the kitchen, our fridge died, right? As appliances, especially shitty modern appliances sometimes do. So our fridge died. And... So, you know, we did the things that you have to do. You pull the fridge out from the wall, you take everything out of it, right? You put towels around the base so that as the ice melts, right? It's gonna sort of soak the towel instead of puddling everywhere, right? So pull this thing into the center of the room. And as it happens, my mother's house has an unheated sun porch, which is directly off from the kitchen. And it was winter. So we just took things that required refrigeration. We went into the sun porch and we put them in the sun porch and, right? Temporary problem solved, right? So like, I don't know, two weeks later or something, I'm in the kitchen and I'm in there, and I maybe had been doing some writing or something and, uh, um, and I have a cup of coffee and I put the cup of coffee up on the high table and I'm doing something in the kitchen and then my mom is in the kitchen and she says, oh my God, I, I need to do something about that fridge. Like I've got to get a replacement fridge. And all of a sudden I blinked because I just, I was like, what? And like it took me a second to catch up. And then I was like, oh yeah, right, the fridge. Now, the fridge, the fridge, it's a full-size fridge, is in the middle of our kitchen. The kitchen's not very big. It's like scarcely bigger than a galley kitchen. It's narrow and somewhat long. But I had just adjusted, right, in a stable fashion. It just the new reality was now, there, right, if you needed something that was cold, you went into the back room and there was this elevated surface that you could put your coffee cup on while you were doing stuff. It was like a table in the middle of the room. And that's it. It had turned invisible for me in, in, to a certain extent, right? That's a function of the fact that I am low senses, that I'm introverted, and that I am stable, right? Uh, and for me, it's a somewhat extreme case. It often, it's very hard for me sometimes to pick up features of the external world. But my, my inner world 
right? My sense of categories and possibility and stuff are, um, I think, in, in speaking with other people, I think quite rich, right? So I have a very rich uh, inner life, right? Um, and that's not to say, right, again, I don't want to sort of bias this conversation to make it sound like extroverts don't have rich lives. They do. But a lot of their invested focus is external, whereas um, my, my inner life is extremely vivid and sort of dramatic and filled with possibility, um, right, in, in a certain way, and in a way that is not quite as dependent on things in the external world. Now, like I said, this is something I've worked on. When I did live alone during that period of my 20s, as I've mentioned, uh, I made a sort of cardinal error about functions and I actually pushed really hard. I decided at the time that actually, you know, despite everything I read, that, um, uh, that uh, intuition was superior in some sense. I decided to push on it, basically develop it more and more and more and more. And indeed I did at the time. I began to test sort of more and more and more introverted and it definitely showed up, right? Like my sense of sort of, um, I don't know, you know, archetypal awareness, my ability to have uh, like uh, trans contextual thinking and analogy and right, what if simulations, right? Projections into the future and et cetera, right? All those intuitive functions like, you know, went through the roof, right? And I, I did a lot of good work in the period. But correspondingly, my sensing functions just cratered. And some of that had to do with, frankly, developing at the time a really unhealthy relationship to my physical body. I resented it. It was like, I, I increasingly just wanted to be like a floating, transparent, ghostly, blue energy brain, right? My body was an inconvenience. Why are you hungry again? Why are you tired again? Why are you sore again? Why are you constantly needing things? It was like, uh, it was like a nuisance. It was, it was something I wanted to scrape off my shoe. Needless to say, this is not a healthy attitude towards your body, in my opinion. Um, and it's not a particularly balanced one. And when I finally kind of came to that recognition, I had to work really hard to come back to my body, right, in a certain sense. Um, but but by the same token, like it's true that there are sort of fields of possibility, right? That pushing out into intuitive space um, makes accessible that can be sort of remarkably powerful, right? Uh, and are not easily accessible to everybody. If you are the sort of person who is indeed an intuitive dominant, it is likewise rarer in the population. And if you are the sort of person you have probably had the kind of experience where you have shared, you've managed to communicate some of your intuitive material to somebody who is sensate dominant. And if they're not dismissive of it, often it's entrancing for them, right? It's, it's a kind of vision that they don't easily have access to. The reverse is true, right? Which is that people who are extremely sensate can be enormously appealing, right? Because they have this, this rich and intimate connection to sense that can be, um, uh, really powerful, really compelling. And I should point out that this is often the case of your, your counterpoint functions, right? If your dominant function is thinking, you may find feelers irritating, but you may also find them quite compelling, quite attractive, because it's obvious to you that they have facility, right, in an area. So it's not uncommon to see couples, right, that come together that match these feelings in a compensatory way. And in some ways, that's not so bad. If you, can, if you can bridge it and learn how to communicate in each other's languages, as it were, that can be quite good because it gives you compensatory functioning within a couple. Whereas if you come together as a couple, even a couple of friends, and you share functions, um, yeah, that's really powerful because you're speaking the same languages and so you can go quite deep. But by the same token, right, you're often prey to folie à deux, right? You, you have the same kinds of blind spots a lot of the time, right? And uh, well, to say nothing of like a ton of confirmation bias in terms of your perceptions of things if you're not checking them. So, okay, now let's talk a little bit because I've mentioned this, the types we've given this. I know you guys have already done some reading about this and you've done the MBTI, we've got a minute left. So I'm gonna talk about sort of dominant and secondary and tertiary and inferior just real quick with like a minute. Okay, your dominant function is the function you're gonna to tend to go to. That's one of these four, thinking, feeling, intuition, sensing, and it will be expressed introverted or extroverted in a particular way. Your dominant function is your go-to, okay? But as I said, it falls prey to, if you give somebody a hammer, they treat everything as a nail. Because you're good with it, because you feel skilled with it, comfortable with it, your dominant function is the one that you're gonna to tend to jump to even when it's not appropriate. 
And it's one of those things you got to break yourself of. If you have an easily recognizable dominant function, okay, and you are like, yeah, well, that's the best function. Hmm. I would counsel that, in fact, you are suffering from a, a probably a fairly serious bias in that respect, right? If you tend to think of people with the opposite function as being, you know, whatever derogatory you want to apply, right, or broken or inhuman, you are likewise missing out. You'll have a couple of functions in the middle. So your dominant is your best function. You'll have a couple of functions in the middle, right? Other than your dominant primary function. Okay, these are like your secondary and tertiary. You'll be variably good at these and you'll probably get better over time. I'm pausing that because it's about to beep, but I'm going to go for another 30 seconds or so. So often, okay, that's a place where you can make a relatively easy developmental advancement. Okay, it's not that hard at the end of the day because getting conscious access to it, it's not as easy as your dominant uh, primary function, but you can still get conscious access at the very least usually to one and then probably with some work to the other. But your inferior function, the one that is opposite your dominant function and opposed in terms of its introversion extroversion, whew, that's often hard, really, really hard. It's it's by definition as your inferior function tends to be your most unconscious function. Now, there are interesting ways to get at this and I've, I've never again managed to track this quote down. I look every few months to track it down, but I read, <laughs> I read in a book by a Jungian once and if I could find this, uh, it would be wonderful. I read in a book by a Jungian once talking about function theory that one of the interesting things and you know, take this with a grain of salt obviously, but one of the interesting things that you see relative to the superior, right, the dominant function and the inferior function, uh, is how they express when people drink alcohol, right? And the implication was that uh, when you drink alcohol, the disinhibition, right, so one, alcohol tends to sort of um, gradually impair conscious functioning and inhibition, right, but it also disinhibits unconscious functioning, okay? So, what you see is that very often you'll see people's inferior function come out when they're hammered, right? When they're drunk, you'll see people's inferior function come out, but it comes out in this clumsy way. So the, the implication here is like the person who is generally like a hardcore feeler or sorry, a hardcore thinker suddenly gets a bunch of drinks in them and becomes, I love you, man, that guy or gal or whomever, um, right? Is the, the function emerges in a powerful way, but also clumsily because there isn't, I mean, for one, because they're drunk, but also because there isn't the same degree of conscious facility with it, right? Likewise, okay, you'll often get people who are feeler types who will suddenly, when they're drinking, start getting into arguments, right? Where arguments means they're trying to do sort of rational argumentation of some kind. But the thing is, it's their inferior function. And for other people who are interacting with them, it's like they're not doing it well. They're just doing it very stridently, right? Okay, so again, there's this kind of expression. And you can think about this. Um, I can speak to this to some extent. If I uh, pass the threshold of a few points, my sensate nature definitely surges up. And I notice this, um, you know, in a variety of altered states, but the altered state around alcohol, it's really quite noticeable. If I've had a few drinks, my sensate stuff comes out in a way that it doesn't normally. I, my ability to like discern colors goes up. That state is also amplified for me under other conditions that tend to impair my conscious dominant function. So um, if I'm hungover, for instance, or if, I, um, uh, if I'm sleep deprived. So uh, since those two things often combine together after a, a slightly foolhardy um, venture of, of drinks, right? The next day, my sensory abilities are massively, massively more acute at some level than they normally are, but they're not skilled, right? I don't have facility or language for that space. It just becomes more conscious and evident to me. The function sort of surges to the fore. And um, yeah, you know, for sensate dominance, very often, right? Sort of possibility fields and what ifs and philosophizing suddenly surge to the fore um, under their condition too. Normally they, again, are ultra kind of brass tacks, right? And like, you know, what is, what is? And suddenly they'll get weirdly philosophical. So anyway, think about that, reflect on it. Like I said, I mean, this isn't an empirical finding by any stretch, but it speaks interestingly to conditions that sort of allow the expression of the inferior function. And the important thing to remember here, okay, is that for Jung, 
the inferior function is essentially speaking, working in the space of the inferior function is your portal into the unconscious. By doing stuff in that space, right? You're, you are almost certainly interacting with less conscious and unconscious parts of your mind, right? So if there is one of these functions that you're like, uh, that's where the work is. Yes, there is the work obviously of, right, your secondary and tertiary function, right, and a certain amount of balancing. And you want to ultimately be able to develop some facility with all of the functions because they're all useful. They're different tools for different scenarios. None of them is fixed and none of them is better. They are just different and, and right, useful in different contexts. So, okay. So that is an introduction to function, such as it is supplemental, of course, to the things you already saw. Um, and then let me think for the next video, what are we talking about? Oh, I'm going to talk a little bit about watchword. Uh, and then hmm, provided that I think that it's not going to be overloading because I am, I am trying to be cognizant of how much material I'm giving you guys. I, I looked at it at one point and I was like, I am asking you to like above and beyond reading just the video flow is a lot. So, I'm trying to dial that a little back for your sake, but I want to make sure that we do have the basics and then I'm commenting on things in a useful way for you. So um, yeah, time permitting, I might speak a little bit today about shadow, but possibly I will defer that slightly. We'll, we'll see what I feel like once I've got the thing on your watchword matrix worked out. So functions. <laughs>